pleasure to be here and I was invited last September but my visa couldn't be processed so I apologize but thank you once again. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Science Matters today. The, the, this is this initiative that we, uh, we started um, several years ago and, and uh, by, because I'm also an active researcher I want to give you uh, both the perspectives, one from the uh, author's perspective or the researcher's perspective and from the publisher's perspective. So the, the, we'll, talk a uh, we'll talk a little bit today about the current uh, scenario that exists in, in, uh, in, in the publishing state where the current scenario does, uh, it, it is not so bad. Yeah. Otherwise it wouldn't have evolved to this uh, state. So there are, there are clearly some advantages to the current scenario. And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, when one looks at the impact of the research and the impact factor of the journal which, uh, where the article is published, so there is some kind of a linear correlation. So there is clearly, uh, there is no doubt that the, 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 some of the best journals publish some of the best work. And so, but um, there are deviations and there are outliers and there is anomalies and so we'll talk a, talk a little bit about that. And the, and the bad thing about science communication, you know, the, the existing form of it is that it doesn't allow much of the data that we, um, we generate or much of the findings that, that we make in the laboratory to get it published. So this is the, this I call it like the bad side of the publication, the, with, that it allows withholding of information because you can't publish almost all the findings that you make. And second is the ugly part is the irreproducibility part. <clears throat> and this is something that we all know that the, uh, that there is substantial amount of work that we publish that cannot be reproduced. And uh, is it bad? Is it bad? To, uh, to some extent it is bad, but it's also, you know, as a systems biologist and somebody who studies, uh, studies the cause of a disease that, that uh, affects a uh, few people, that is uh, Alzheimer's disease, it's not, uh, uh, you, you, you go to an age and then, and then everyone gets that disease. And so there is heterogeneity and there's variability in, in, in people, it's the same with, with cells, it's the same with batches. And, and so there is a lot of irreproducibility that, come, that could come because of heterogeneity and variability in the systems that we use. Right? So that is, to some extent, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ugly part. But it's not necessarily always harmful. But there is the ugliest part and the reproducibility that comes with this one. Right? That this is alarming. This is something that we should be terrified about. That there is the inherent component of fraudulence in order to give in to the pressure of publishing. That, that, that people do think that they would have to cut corners. They would have to do something which is not uh, morally correct or legally correct. They would do something in order to get it published. And that is fraudulence and that's something that we should all uh, uh, worry about. And so um, I'm going to tell you a few instances where uh, this, this has happened. This is, this is from Retraction Watch where you could, you could see the kind of papers that get retracted. And, uh, and this is most of the times due to fraudulence. There are several times where uh, the authors acknowledge that this, is, uh, this cannot be reproduced due, due to other factors. But in, in, in many cases, this is the stem cell fact. The, the staff protocol paper to, to several other uh, papers that we published here in these, in these journals. And, um, and, and this is also from my uh, own field is Alzheimer's research where um, a colleague of mine published. And, and the, these papers were retracted both from Cell and Nature. And uh, so when I talked to, uh, talk to this colleague, uh, he said that almost all of this fraudulent data came from the first author, right? So it's completely that the first author's fault. So he's the corresponding author of those papers. That the, uh, the postdoc did all the, uh, the bad, the, the, the bad behavior exclusively came from, uh, which, is, which is interesting, right? You know, to, if, if it were to be, um, if, if the Nobel Committee would call him and say the postdoc is getting his, <laughs> Would, if the postdoc way to get the Nobel Prize, would uh, would the credit be so totally shifted to the postdoc? I don't know. But when there is blame, we do we do somehow think that that uh, it's the others who do this. And this is from the on the right side. You see Oliver Weiner, who was the 
professor at the ETH, who um, seemed to have published largely correct things, but um, but somehow he managed to see uh, where the storyline was going, but the the experimental data somehow didn't fit, so he had to make it fit to tell the story. So it's, it's really this is these are these studies where. Uh, you, you, it's not entirely that everything was cooked up, but it's somehow the core data was uh, was pretty good, but the peripheral data that you would have to tell the narrative in a coherent and a convincing way was missing, so you tried. And uh, when there was investigation, uh, which all started with PubPeer, which is this online journal club that you probably know, that where you could, whereas as, as a reader, one could anonymously comment on papers that are published, there, um, there, the um, uh, um, uh, a reviewer for his uh, older paper that was submitted to another journal where it got rejected. But when she saw that this paper got published somewhere else, and and with the same data that they 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 submitted to, and she objected to that this data was published, and so she raised these objections in uh, in in PubPeer, which then led to several of these retractions and people. Then started to look closely to the data and then found that there are there are several instances of data manipulation and fraudulence. And and um, one of the interesting things is that when they looked at his computer, they even found folders called loading controls. If you're biology, if you're molecular biologist, you would understand that when you, when you do Western blotting, you would have to when things change. For example, a gene perturbation or the methodology changes. Uh, the levels of proteins or the status of the protein, uh, then you would have to show that you didn't uh, you didn't deliberately add less or more of that protein. So you would have what is called a loading control. So he had a, a, a binders full of a folder full of loading control that for three uh, three lane to twelve lane, thirty eight kilodalton to fifty six kilodalton to whatever. One wonders why. One wonders why. Uh, why uh, such such behavior in terms of uh, looking at the data? This is another story that is a very fascinating uh, uh, story. That this is uh, this paper on that was published in Science um, uh, just last year that talked about an, a phenomenal social uh, social science problem. One is that that um, <clears throat> when you live in a homophobic neighborhood, that that all that you have to do is really go and tell your neighbors that gay people exist and they are harmless, right? So this awareness, this teaching uh, 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 individuals that that uh, about homosexuality and making them aware, kind of uh, increase the tolerance. This is amazing. This is just this is just phenomenal. And so the um, a, a lot of uh, news outlets picked up the story. They were very excited about this idea. And then it turned out that that the first author, when asked if he could provide the, the raw data, he said this is this is not possible to to do because of privacy issue. And then later on, he said it, he expunged all the data, and and then like you know he really bur burnt all the data to the ground. And then uh, and um, and then there uh, uh, it turned out that he also had a standing offer from Princeton University for an assistant professorship and the science paper would have paid away and 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 made a long story short this this uh, this idea uh, the demand to to get this uh, raw data that he he didn't comply also made uh, the retraction watch um, founder Ivan Oransky to directly contact the editor of editor in chief of science at twitter and said, this is just not possible that you publish a processed data, uh, but we need to look at the raw data. And uh, it turned out that since he couldn't provide, this paper was retracted. And, and, and so we still don't know whether the story is, is right, if it's, if it's OK to go to a homophobic neighborhood and say that, uh, and, and start practicing. And so this is an interesting cell biological paper that came from University of Malaysia that almost the same set of data was published in three different journals. Minimum two reviewers per uh, journal, so there are like six reviewers. Uh, uh, there's six I, uh, uh, six reviewers would have seen it. Twelve eyes would have seen this, and it it turned out that this paper, that's this image that you look at, 
is uh, is pretty interesting that they are just looking at the kind of cell shape or the kind of the the way the cells are in different stages in cell cycle or the stages where they represent one, two, three, four. One wonders um, if the if the reviewers asked. It's not enough to show one cell. They probably showed only one cell for each each stage, and uh, the reviewers probably asked, "We should show more cells." They probably said, "No problem," <laughs> and so they showed more cells. So those who laugh, you probably have seen it, that they actually digitally cloned each cell. <laughs> they cut and pasted these one, and then they pasted two is exactly the same. It's like this is largely. <laughs> And so, you, you, and this paper actually passed through three, uh, and this same set of data was published in three different journals. And so, this is alarming. This is uh, not anymore uh, um, an insider information that would be contained in 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 the university halls, and then there would be gossip uh, at the water cooler that, like, you know, we know that this lab is not very good. It's gone all those days where this used to be an insider contained information. Now people know that, that scientists cheat. And that's like a very alarming. That's like, why would scientists cheat when you get, I mean, I mean I'm in Switzerland, so the pay is not so bad. But in, in many parts of the world, scientists get paid very, very OK. And the reason that we do is because we, in addition to money, we get dopamine release and serotonin getting released when, when we have awesome data. When we think that, that this is going to be a breakthrough discovery that's going to help humankind, or even my academic curiosity makes me happy. But, but to, to understand that, that, that scientists do cheat, and that science goes wrong through these, these uh, efforts, people try to, to look at what, allow, what makes scientists to behave the way that they do. And then one of the things could be that, that there is this really enormous pressure to tell this awesome stories, to get this out into the public and saying that you know we've cured cancer and Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson in every paper that we publish, right? You have to demonstrate that a caffeine works this way. Like it's, a, and so John Oliver covered, as you probably know, he, uh, <clears throat> he covered in a in a late night uh, show about how scientists do this. Uh, they they sell this uh, 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 in a sensationalized way all the time, and the media picks it up and then and then does its own spin. And, and, and so the White House to National Science Foundation to NIH to, to the Swiss National Science Foundation and even uh, your own university takes this uh, in, into notification. And that it's, it's not, if it were to be affecting only a few of them, it's still, alar it's still disturbing. But the alarming fact is that there is this translational aspect of this irreproducibility. The translational aspect of irreproducibility in the sense that if you're in in biomedical sciences, if you're an academic who publishes a paper, let's say you're identifying a, a, a protein that could be a potential biomarker for prostate cancer, um, <clears throat> you know, you could get a nature paper and that allows you to become a professor or, or tenure or get a grant uh, on it. But it also has these other costs that the pharmaceutical industry puts in a lot of money to, to many uh, industries putting a lot of money to, to, uh, to develop drugs based on that. And that seems to have <clears throat> an enormous cost of around $28 billion every year that we uh, invest into this, into the efforts of reproducing, into the efforts of bringing into a clinic. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to show you a paper that we struggled to publish in, in Nature. That was um, that basically refuted the major claims of, of a paper that was published in Nature by uh, by Paul Greengard, who is a Nobel laureate uh, from Rockefeller. So it's a, it's this pretty dangerous combination of a Nobel laureate from Rockefeller publishing in Nature and you, a small fry, saying that's not true. And so we uh, uh, so we uh, it was about identifying a, a new protein as the holy grail target for Alzheimer's disease. That's going to be this thing. And, and so we were all excited. That's how it starts. And, um, and then so when we started to reproduce this, this paper, we found that it, this couldn't be reproduced. And so we went to Nature. And after two and a half years of struggle, um, they rejected. So I had to create my own journal to get it published. 
And so Science Matters is one of them, and we did publish. I'll tell you at the end. And, and so you can see that if, if, if it comes out from these labs, and or like if you say that this is, this, is, uh, this is a discovery that has been published and vetted by the peers in this journal, you automatically, you passively assign credibility. Right? This, you, you, you imagine that it's, it is going to be the, uh, it is going to be solid and, 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 and we um, invest um, a lot of money and resources and, 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 uh, and personnel. So, and, uh, and, and so that's, uh, to, to finish the introduction part, really, this is this, uh, the whole struggle that we have. The struggle that the, 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 to come here is already very long that you would have to make an observation into a narrative and then to, to sell it and to write, it, write a good paper. And then you have to tell the story in a very, you know, uh, if you've listened to editors telling you how to publish, uh, it's really amazing. You have to be very good in English. Uh, you would have to be very good in telling a storyline and, and all of it deviating quite a bit away from, from the, the core finding that, that is there to waiting to be told. But then after that, this is this journey that you have to take until you can publish. So this is a pressure, and this is the struggle that one has. But this is only half of the struggle. This is only the side where we have barriers. Most of them are artificial barriers that are put out to, to communicate a research finding um, to, to, uh, uh, to the knowledge space that we want to contribute to. And the other side is really <clears throat> the, the, um, uh, the access to knowledge. And I will, I'll talk to you about the access to knowledge in just a second. The, there's this uh, the university um, scenario where I'm, uh, I, I teach and I do research and I train and I mentor a lot of students. And when the students were asked, <clears throat> what is the greatest, uh, uh, what do you want to do uh, in, in, in the academic career? Um, Nature conducted this interview, and, and a lot of people said the incentives to be first can be much stronger than the incentives to be right. So if you're somebody who is really uh, involved in, in robustly validating a finding, it could be a confirmatory finding, it could be something that you um, you, you're involved in reproducing things to tell people that this is going to be a right target or this is going to be a valid theorem. That is not any more important. It is like the, it's like what we discussed today. It is more important to put the news first. It can be uh, uh, from anywhere between alternative facts to uh, uh, a solid fake news, but as long as you're first, it somehow carries uh, a reward. And so this should alarm us, should, this should disturb us quite a bit. These are the kind of people that we, we somehow uh, um, train, that they have this desire to tell a story first, or to, to, to be first, than to be right. And, 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 uh, and as I said, this is, the, this is a paper that is published by Charles Darwin, <clears throat> an 1858 paper that is still under paywall, that is still behind paywall. This is, uh, this is true. And that is the other side that I talked to you about, that uh, in, in the university setting like Cambridge or ETH or the University of Zurich or MIT or any Institute of Science, this is the creme de la creme of us. We do get access to knowledge just like that from your uh, the, the online subscriptions to etc. My library uh, pays an incredible amount of money. You won't believe that's like tons of money just to get access to one publisher, right? I have a foundation in India which is which helps rural students to pursue research, and when we travel into these rural places in India and then we go to these educational institutes, there's hardly any any access to it because it's just impossible for them to have any access to knowledge. That is created by scholars without any input, funding input from the publishers, right? So that's this is this is uh, um, this is the other side that I told told you about. So on one hand, we have this uh, pressure to or or barriers to 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 co contribute to knowledge. On the other hand, we also have barriers to access published knowledge. And so how do we change this? 
uh, and, and we need to change it. So we live in an era where it is impossible to, to have uh, uh, barriers to, to access knowledge and the same kind of contribute. So, and, and, and seven, seven years ago, seven and a half years ago, I thought about, about ethics and integrity and, 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 and in terms of what, uh, what could be done in a way that we could <clears throat> somehow um, address the scenario. I'm not sure if we manage. I'm not sure if this is the right solution or if it's the only solution. But there's one thing that we thought is that, <clears throat> that perhaps the story uh, line, that there, there's a desire to narrate a, a coherent and a cogent storyline of your finding. So when you have a finding that you have to make it to a story, that is probably where the problem is. That everyone makes an observation, everyone has a hypothesis, we work on it, uh, be it negative, be it positive, there is something that, that, that comes out of it. Um, but you can't publish this, right? You can't, uh, but you would have to uh, incorporate in, a, in some kind of a narrative box that can be packaged and submitted to a journal from the start. Uh, you, you would have to do. And then you would have to tell it in a very coherent way, right? You can't have these rough edges. You can't tell the reviewer that it's impossible. I don't know what it means, but this is what I observe. And, and so we think that this, just the, the very fact that the stories are just better to read. And when they were printed, uh, um, printed options, you couldn't publish these observations and tell the people, like, come back any time in the future. Maybe we would have uh, explanation to it. Right? I find this. <clears throat> so I visited uh, uh, I visited Alexander Fleming Museum uh, just um, just yesterday, and uh, and uh, and and, um, and that, this is this this is this guy who walks into the lab after a vacation and finds these bacterial plates that he was culturing. One of these plates contained a fungus, right? a mold that was growing on a bacterial plate, and um, he sees this and says, oh, that is interesting, that wherever the mold was growing, the bacteria was not, uh, uh, was not growing. So that's, that is an observation that he makes and, and, um, and, and, and publishes this observation, has an observation that this is this, uh, that wherever this bacterial, uh, the, the, the fungus grows, the bacteria couldn't. I wonder if, I wait to be Fleming today, or if I have a Fleming today, or Fleming wait to be in my lab today, could we publish these observations? So yeah, it's one of these obs very few observations that actually contributed to extending lifespan in, in, in uh, humanity. And that paper, if it were to be submitted today, if Fleming were to submit this observation today, you would typically get peer reviewer comments like, it's interesting, but it's immature. We don't know what the molecule, what is the molecule? Though he called it penicillin in this paper in 1928, he never isolated penicillin. He didn't know whether it could be protein, it could be, it could be smaller molecule, or et cetera. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, um, he, would have, uh, he would have been asked, uh, what is the molecular mechanism through which this, this mold juice acts? And if you submit, to a journal like Science or Nature Medicine, you would have to cure half the population of Africa to get to the, uh, to, to into these journals. So that you would have to show this translation arm at the time when he published, it didn't. And then he would come back and extend after a couple of years that it is penicillin with Florey and Chain and others and, and in a collaborative manner. And then later on, they would solve the structure of penicillin. And then at 40 years down the lane, you would understand the mechanism of it. But today, you would have to package everything in order to, to have a paper published. And, and we believe that, that this is possibly one, one place where things could have gone wrong. And if you could have only allowed people to, to, to publish this single observation without a larger or a sexier or a sensationalizing story context, uh, this could contribute to uh, to the two things that I talked to you about, the non-communication of reproducibility, that, um, that one solution we think is to really be single or to go uh, into this idea that uh, single and smaller uh, observation-based publishing, not storyline. So we created Science Matters as, as um, a platform that would be seen in the flyer that would, that where we do not publish stories, we do not publish narratives, but we publish um, 
exclusively single observation. Single observation meaning that, that it is one observation but not one off. Uh, it's an observation that uh, uh, akin to uh, figure one of a paper where you observe something but then you validate with controls and proper statistics and that should be published and that we do publish uh, without a story context, right? So, so as an author you could, you could submit and we, um, well, a lot of people think that this is super interesting in an innovative way, but it's actually to, to capitalize on observations has been always the case in the past. That uh, the, the shift from an observation to a narrative came only very recently because we had to prioritize. There were so many papers that were coming. You would have to, uh, one of the things would be to, uh, to, to prioritize a, a, a fuller narrative over an observation that wasn't complete. And so you can see that this is the uh, Robert Hooke, the truth is the science of nature has been already too long, only a work of the brain and, and, and the fancy. It is now high time that it should return to the cleanness and soundness. In other words, bo the boring nature of observation on material and obvious things. If you were to remove this off and put or, it would still make a lot of sense. The science or nature has already been too long. Uh, 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 made only a work of the brain and the fancy. That, 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 that observation seems to be important and, and it is and, uh, and, um, and so we, we, we believe that uh, we could go back but now with the digital space we could even be more, uh, uh, we could innovate it. And so, so this is the way that we publish that uh, I shall show you in a, in, a, in a minute that we use this what you see is what we get template and Overleaf is one of those uh, uh, publishing platforms where uh, they make these templates and uh, for different journals, we, we make it for uh, our uh, uh, science matters instead of just uh, submitting in PDF and, 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 and different formats. So you, you submit, you describe this data that or you describe this observation in the platform and then it goes through a triple blind peer review. This is the first time that we use what we call as this triple blind peer review because the uh, humans have bias and uh, it's only natural that we have bias. But it's just that we uh, we somehow uh, some use this bias to evaluate science, uh, the, and that that we think it's not very good. Um, there there are instances where people have demonstrated that if you were to take the same scientific content, but then change the identity of the authors or the institution, that take uh, that uh, uh, gets a different. Uh, uh, take or different, it has a different credibility status um, based on who publishes and not what or where uh, you publish. And, and second is that there was um, uh, uh, there was a reviewer from Italy who reviewed for <clears throat> PLOS One a paper that was authored by two women and he rejected this paper and said the paper could be of much better quality if the authors could where to recruit a male co-author, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, you can imagine the kind of bias that people have, and uh, and this is something that we do. We we we, we see this that there is human bias, and, uh, and so the one thing that we decided is that when we create science matters, science alone should matter, and and the other these things uh, shouldn't. And particularly when you're describing an observation, it doesn't matter whether you come from MIT or an Indonesian rural institute, for example, uh, as long as the data described is, is relevant and, and it, it is technically well done. And so we, it goes through the triple blind peer review, which then where the editors as well as the reviewers are anonymous and so are the authors. And, and, then, uh, and, and then once it's, it's been to, to, it's a quantitatively uh, reviewed, and then it gets published and then uh, now uh, you can come back as an author and publish these extensions. So it's, it's like a legal way of publishing uh, and, and, and so you publish these pieces in a way but then the narrative, you tell them, um, you tell the narrative by extending these uh, subsequent obs observations. So you publish the single but robustly validated observation which could be of any type, it's an orphan data, many times we do have orphan observations that we start with. Uh, a negative and confirmatory or continuing data, it's pre-publication peer reviewed as well as 
this allow we do uh, allow authors to come back and extend and um, others can also extend so as a result it's really modular and 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 uh, now what you have done is that by publishing this this observation you're also allowing others to publish so our platform allows this um, lego like ex extensions both in the horizontal as well as the vertical way and as a result we could tell the narrative together in, in a more collaborative way that a narrative emerges naturally uh, 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 as opposed to an author pruned version that i i give in to the suggestions and the and the whims and fancies and uh, of the reviewer how the story should be told or or uh, but one aspect could be that we tell the story together there the story can have these rough edges these are things that i cannot explain at the moment but i'm going to present it anyways this is a part of the narrative as opposed to the way that we do that removing all the negative and contradictory data you know, what if the, the the reviewer is going to use it as an achilles heel to church shoot down this paper and so this <clears throat> in this way uh, a narrative could emerge and this is what we try to do and and um, and uh, by allowing authors to publish observations instead of uh, larger narratives, what we have done is also to reduce these observations to what we call as a node. And, and, and so as soon as you, you have these nodes uh, as observation, let's say in this case, this, uh, on the left, you have, um, you have an observation like Fleming's observation. And people can come back and extend. When they extend, we also try to qualify these edges instead of just having a black uh, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> black edge that says this is this has been cited or like a way that that papers are cited uh, today it's cited in introduction or in, in in the objective or in a discussion all have the same weightage here for example how you cite how you link your observation to the other whether you have reproduced it you're continuing <clears throat> in that way we could now use principles of network theory in terms of visualizing data, right? And, and in this way, we could really uh, see whether, <clears throat> whether this observation is a seeding, a positive seeder, or a, a, a non-reproducible non seed. And uh, this is, for example, the Alzheimer's paper that came out of Rockefeller, uh, published in Nature. So one could see immediately that whether this is an, uh, a node that is more reproducible, whether the scientist has produced more reproducible seeds or extended. So the metric on which that we would, uh, we would evaluate either science or scientists could be different. And we go in this direction of creating what we call as the internet of science by allowing people to contribute and evaluate and publish peer reviewed, but no way of observations. And in that way, we could kind of create together an internet of science instead of having a Google uh, that provides us <clears throat> from all kinds of uh, search results, including uh, uh, science, but we could have scientific search engine where we would, uh, uh, where the results are not displayed verbose or in, 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 uh, in a verbose manner, but really as a visualized network that we can exercise options on seeing whether it is, uh, how far it's extended, or what kind of data is presented together and whether these these uh, uh, these in, uh, information is is uh, is a part of a reproducible or non-reproducible network. So this is this is where our uh, interest and and the goal of science matters is. And so we <clears throat> we think that stories really can wait. It's not like stories don't matter. So stories do matter, and and as a result, but they can wait. That by allowing these single observations to be published, and then by linking both from the authors and the other. Uh, um, colleagues um, in a way that uh, we can uh, we can have this narrative that emerges and once this uh, narrative has <clears throat> has uh, um, is, is of a certain size then we allow the authors and the contributing uh, others to tell a narrative in a review form so we think that the narratives can be published and they should be published only when these individual data are reviewed and vetted outside the story context and and uh, and in that way that that uh, the, the matters narratives for example comes much later and uh, and it's it's open access because I don't talk about open access because I think it should be the default in 2000 uh, whatever it should have been default we shouldn't pay for um, 
uh, scholarly information where um, the publishers have not contributed to the funding of the uh, of the of the, of the study. And uh, and it is fast. We do for um, um, so uh, we have a typical two two week uh, um, uh, two week timeline to to get it um, get it reviewed. And it is uh, free at the moment. And when we when we charge, we will charge around one hundred and fifty dollars. Half of it we pay to the reviewers and the editors will contribute to the evaluation of the study, and half of it we use for article processing. We live in a world where uh, people charge five thousand two hundred for an open access article that is only online, and I have no idea where that five thousand two hundred dollar goes. I have a publishing platform where. We we barely manage, but we do manage with with one hundred and fifty dollars, uh, and and so this is the uh, the submission procedure. The last couple of minutes, I'll just tell you. So when you go to Science Matters, uh, so the you have our online editor, uh, or you could, we also have this word template that you could download. Uh, um, but we recommend this online editor, and uh, and this is how it looks like. It's the title, and and we collect a lot of metadata that would be important for later curation of this data, and. Um, and then, uh, so this is the um, discipline and then observation type. When you click there, it will ask you if it's a standalone or a follow-up. And if it's a follow-up, you give the details whether you are the author or somebody else's uh, results. Your uh, and so these are these. Uh, it it has a very simple way of uh, of uh, submitting. You could really submit within an hour. Uh, and and the, and the interesting thing is that we do have certain unique features as well in this that we ask people to say limitations. Uh, what didn't allow them to go to a narrative platform that well, this uh, or this the system has limitations we also ask for alternative explanations because we think that uh, a, uh, an, an idea could have different perspectives or interpretation could have different uh, 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 sides to do an interpretation but we also ask conjectures we we think this is this could help uh, people open up about their uh, they are finding, and instead of just keeping it secret and 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 developing it, uh, you know, without talking to a colleague and etc., we now think that we can just break that barrier. So you publish, you you get the credit for it. It's, it's published on your name, but then you could also say, where is it leading to? What did, in your opinion, how does this observation lead to a storyline? And so you talk about it, and as a result, we could invite criticism versus uh, versus uh, 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 contribution from authors to see. Uh, the others, the readers, to, to contribute to the storyline, <clears throat> and uh, and that's pretty much it is. And we also um, this this largely comes from the idea that the online editor came from this uh, uh, my trip to to some of these rural <clears throat> rural institutions where they don't have so much money for research, but they certainly don't have so much money for publishing because it's. Uh, uh, <clears throat> And uh, they also don't have so much money to get license for these, for these, um, for these softwares that they have to use to publish. Uh, this is something that we don't, where we don't understand, we don't realize it, because when you get into a university like this, you get a word and a word document and etc., Photoshop and etc. So here we combined it together, and um, uh, uh, we combined it together, and so the reference manager is something that we created ourselves, the word, the platform we created, and <clears throat> we also created a, a Photoshop a, a plugin, uh, a, a very basic plugin, so that you can assemble your figures. And uh, and so uh, that that is uh, the thing that I told you about: the submission, editorial check, and assigning of editors, uh, quantitative evaluation, revision. But uh, before we publish, after the revised version. We send it to our director of data integrity, who looks at it, uh, looks at the statistical analysis to to um, to image uh, quality and etc. And and then we publish. Uh, basically, these are these examples where you could see here, for example, this is the paper that I told you about that uh, that we saw. That we say that this is not the this is the um, contradicting uh, paper that uh, that uh, we tell them and. Um, and and so the next ones are the reproducibility matters we introduce. So right now uh, we have two journals, which is matters, which is the flagship journal, technically well done and it should be published. But if the peer reviewers think that this has, it's like, um, it's going to be fantastic. It's it's like another Fleming like paper or like this. There's a potential to 
to cure Alzheimer's disease, this observation, this is a gene that is important for identifying a new type of cancer, for example. Then this goes into uh, Matter Select, which is like a uh, higher uh, ranked journal. Uh, and then the next uh, months we will have reproducibility matters where uh, every everyone who tries to reproduce uh, a part of the observation can can um, can publish here both the negative uh, both uh, contradicting as well as confirming and hypothesis matter which would be uh, and, and and medical matters for case studies and medical observations so we do allow people to um, uh, to come and demonstrate uh, demonstrate the platform so we do make publish-a-thons, we go there and demonstrate. So if students would come, or colleagues would come with observation, we help them submit uh, uh, by, by showing them how to submit. And so we are available if, uh, and, and that's like many, many, uh, even the European Commission now uh, is, is endorsing that, that people should publish observations. And uh, pretty much it is. Um, and I thank Martha for inviting me. And this is, this was a great session that where we gave talks together uh, to see her ideas, which is like uh, really uh, geared towards uh, towards addressing the social injustice on this side of uh, uh, of the uh, of the scenario. And uh, and to meet others yesterday. And Hannah, thank you very much. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> No, no, it's good. It's really, you know, it's, I'm passionate about what you're saying, and I think it's really interesting. So thank you very much uh, for inspiring all of us. We are running towards the time of the table, so if I can just allow time for one question, if somebody has. Oh, I the no, I, I think the we do this in a way we can we do talk about the alternative explanation conjecture. There is one problem though is that when you even in discussions when you discuss uh, it, some of these reviewers say that is too speculative, that is too much that you discussed. Why don't you demonstrate? Uh, right. So if that is the thing, why don't you demonstrate? So I mean, I would love it if if the traditional journals. Would adopt this thing and say this is a place where you can really uh, go wild and i think we should go we should let the authors go wild because we don't know where it uh, but but we as as a practicing researcher we i am also afraid to tell too much because then they they would say why don't you demonstrate uh, why don't you show that uh, show with the data so that's but i would love uh, i mean i think people should adopt it anyways right away if it is good Sure. As the chairman, I'll give my opportunity to do that. I just think that how, how do you know that people become a next essayist? So <laughs> that's a great question, which I haven't thought about. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, the it's definitely I, I, so the um, the way that we have structured science matters, and we, you will see in in few months, is that uh, science matters uh, as an organization will have three parts. Uh, one third is uh, governed by the university. So we want universities to be the stakeholders of uh, part of it. And then one third belongs to scientists and who are interested in science. And one third would be management and advisory. So we think that, that science publishing should go back to science. It should be the philosophical society that runs. We think that as a result, we now we invite uh, in institutions and researchers to be stakeholders of um, of, of uh, uh, science matters, that in the long run, that um, that they publish and they also uh, take the take the benefit and, and they take the profit out of it. So in that way, uh, we can't be any other publisher that we just mentioned because we are not capitalistic and we don't we don't go in the direction of uh, making 38 percent 40 percent profit. Uh, this is going to be a kind of a social entrepreneurship that we invite people who contribute to knowledge creation also uh, be the stakeholders when it comes to the organization. We inspire 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laurie, again.